King Gustav, Gustav the III, Gustav the Third, was king of Sweden. He was born in 1746 and he died in 1792. And he was an awesome king. This isn't fiction. This is true. <laughs> he was incredibly fabulous. He had a French-inspired court. He was really in interested in culture. He's ver there's a Verdi opera written about uh, him, Mbala in Mascara, I think it's called, because he was murdered very fabulously, very tragically, but very fabulously at a masked ball. Uh, if you go to Drottningholm Castle uh, to see his own theater building, for instance, you can there see a painting of him dressed up as a knight in an awesome medieval type scene. And of course, he's not a medieval king at all. He was into something that is not LARPing, but a little bit like that. Sometimes King Gustav would perform like a quest adventure trail at his castle where he could get to be the knight, and he would have awesome knight adventures, and the court could follow him and be impressed, and he would be in character. <laughs> they built, uh, we, these are not very well documented, except for that painting, but, but it is known that they, they built castles, prehistoric castles, out of papier-mâché, and they had special effects. For instance, it would be pointless to have knight adventures without dragons, so they had a dragon. And inside the dragons, dragon was one or two peasants, the stories differ. And the king would slay the dragon, and this was of course not the intention, but sometimes the peasant would get stabbed. And that is the price of making, I'm sure the king thought, well that is the price of my LARP art. <laughs> sometimes you stab a peasant. <laughs> This talk is going to be about not stabbing the peasant. Because we don't live in a weird historical society where it's okay for a game master, even if you feel that you are a little bit like a god. It's not okay for you to make other people hurt because of your LARPs. And I speak from great experience with me and many of my LARP maker friends that often you have an idea that seems really good, like it would be really awesome if you had a dragon. Uh, and then that might actually be a dangerous thing. Uh, and it's not just about dragons, it's about everything. So I'm going to talk uh, in this uh, talk about safety. But I will start by establishing this very basic fundamental thing. LARP is not inherently, that means in itself, in, as an in and of itself. LARP is not in and of itself dangerous. Life is pretty dangerous. In LARP, you are most typically in some kind of co controlled environment with people who are paying a lot of attention to what is happening in the now. In life, you may be listening to music and walking in traffic, and that is much more dangerous than being at a LARP. But of course, if somebody hurt themselves in the street, it's not your fault. And if somebody hurts themselves at your LARP, it might be your fault. So it's very important for you to think about these things. Part one, general observations. Because I have a fever, I have written everything that I say into the slides. Uh, and this means that afterwards, if I spoke too fast, you can also just get the slides and, and read what I've said. A uh, good starting point is think before it's too late. That would be think before the accidents have happened. Don't make dangerous games in general. Yes, it would be really awesome to have a lot of untrained people fighting ninja battles with swords. Real swords. <laughs> but just don't do that, because that's dangerous. You know, and I mean... Um, Having a game that involves actual live horses with people who don't know anything about horses is dangerous. Just don't do that. I mean, there are, so these are the sort of common sense things. You must consider the local laws. And if you if you are organizing a place somewhere and you don't know the law, even in your own country, you might not know the law because you have never ever been in a situation before where you have had walked outside with a toy gun, for instance. In many countries, it is illegal to walk around with a gun that looks like a real gun. Uh, and in many countries, if you point, I mean, including in the Nordic countries, if you point a, a toy gun, even if it looks like a toy, at, let's say, a police officer, you may actually get shot. So, so you may not be, uh, and mind, that might not even be their fault, so you, you may not be aware of the laws, but whenever you start deciding a game, think about that, the, find out what is true, uh, what is the law. You should also find out what the local culture is, uh, if you're playing somewhere, or even if just you're playing with only your players, um, maybe, for instance, uh, kissing in public is not a good idea in, in the country you're in, for instance. And common sense, oi, uh, common sense is also a good point, point to start. 
Now, I'm not saying that you can't make things that are a little risky. I generally think in life, this is my, my philosophy, is that grown-ups are allowed to take risk, risks. And in our culture, there are all kinds of things where we let grown-ups do dangerous things and it's not considered harmful. Many sports are very violent, ice hockey for instance, it's popular in the Nordic countries. Mountain climbing is very dangerous and we don't forbid people from trying to go on top of Mount Everest even though we know that many of them will die, that's just the way it works. But there is a cultural tolerance perhaps for injuries in LARP that is lower than the, than the tolerance for injuries in ice hockey because our countries have a long tradition of ice hockey and a very short tradition of LARP. You should take special care with beginning players. You should take special care with children and teenagers. You should take special care with your customers if you are making commercial LARP because they might sue you in many countries. And you must absolutely always take extra special care with non-players because of course it's possible to LARP in public places and there might be people there who are not players. There might be neighbors if you're, even if you're in the forest, somebody might hike in and if you have just performed like a very realistic looking death ritual, the hikers will be really upset. And this has happened. So <laughs> it's a good idea to think about that before. You may want to put up like warning signs and a line around the whole area saying theater is being performed in here or film shoot happening or something like that. Okay, another fundamental thing. You are a small trembling hamster. The human brain has evolved in layers. First the human was a very primitive animal and then we have had, got more and more complex brains. Inside your brain is the hamster brain. And the hamster brain is terrified, fast, and focused on surviving. That's why you jump when something unexpected happens. Then your, first the hamster reacts, then your eyes process what you see, and then you realize it was nothing, and then you're not afraid anymore. But your players will always be hamsters first and players second. And this is an important safety thing to have in mind. So if you do things, especially if you are working with, for instance, horror games, or if you are battles, or you're trying to scare people, remember that people will re react with fight, or flight, or even other instincts, like maybe they are really interested in having sex <laughs> suddenly. And even those, all, all the animal instincts might might override all of your careful planning. Another important thing to remember, and this is quite strange, so you, this is a concept that you might have to think about later, but our sensory system, eyes, ears, noses, all that, our brains do not understand fiction. Our brains, we, we, we don't have an evolutionary concept of what fiction is, what is not true. Impulse is if you are in a LARP and you feel something or see something, if it looks real enough, your, your brain will treat it as real. At the same time, other parts of your brain know that this is not real. And that's what, a big part of the pleasure of fiction. If you read a book, you kind of see it in your mind, and it feels real at the same time it's not real. And that's the pleasure, right? If you see a movie, you can be really into it, and you're not, you forget that you're in a movie theater. Of course, you kind of know that it's not true. And the same thing is happening with LARP. But LARP has higher resolution. Film is two-dimensional. In LARP also there are senses, a sense of smell and so on, so the illusion can be much stronger. You never forget that it's a fiction, but your body does not know that it's a fiction. Only some parts of your brain knows that it's not true. Uh, and this is, this is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but again, it's a good thing to have in the back of your mind when you're making games, especially if they are very realistic. Okay, danger, types of danger that will be covered in this talk. Community safety, physical safety, social safety, and psychological safety. Community safety. Your community, you belong to many communities, large communities. One community is your local LARP club, if you have one, or your society, or your company where you work, or your school, perhaps. Um, you also belong to the group LARPers of country X, and you belong to the group LARPers of your part of the world, and you belong to the group all LARPers in the world. And you have responsibilities towards all of these groups. That means that you are not allowed to go out and ruin our reputation <laughs> for everybody. So if you make stupid decisions, it's not just about dangers to your players in the, in the room, it's also about what the media might write about you, it's about what your government might think, about what your police might think, about what the neighbors might think, and about what will be said about LARP in general. Because LARP is not very well known, and if there's one kind of scandal, it will affect everybody. 
So it's good to think about that. Also, <laughs> the things, things like uh, what do our families think? Maybe uh, many people who go to LARPs have family members who don't go to LARPs, and you have to negotiate for the time. Can I leave you with the kids, husband, while I go away and play? And if this person has a bad perception of LARP, they will go, no. So, so there's also sort of practical things. The better reputation LARP has, the easier it is for us to get resources, like playing grounds, maybe support money, uh, support from museums, or whatever, whatever it is you need. That will also be easy, uh, easier. And it's good to remember, with community safety also, I'm t talking about the physical safety of your players. So again, different societies and different locations have very different tolerances for play in public. In America, for instance, do not ever, ever, ever play with realistic looking guns or any kind of guns in public because so many people are armed and in many states if they feel threatened ordinary people have the right to shoot you it's called the stand your ground law for it. So, so if you want to play games with in which involves realistic looking guns you have to pick a location maybe like a closed room <laughs> where there will not suddenly be any strangers feeling threatened and i'm using this very extreme example of the gun and being shot because because it's very clear, but there are very much milder versions of this as well. Uh, yes, no, I said that. Physical safety. Uh, not only our brains belong to hamsters, our bodies are also basically little hamster bodies. We need to eat, we need to sleep, we need bathrooms, we need shelter, which means we can't be too cold and we can't be too hot. And this is uh, something that you think probably everybody thinks about, you would be surprised at how many people uh, don't think about these things. Um, conditions in different places are very different, and so I'm not going to give you any general rules except use your sen sense. Finnish winters can be very hard. If you fall asleep in the snow, you will die. But I have organized fantasy LARPs in Finnish mi minus 30 degree uh, winters where people slept in tents and the tents were heated and it was completely fine because all the players understood the physical realities of playing in that environment and what kind of clothes they need and so on. Um, I have also been to a LARP-like event in the Nevada desert where I would have absolutely died if we wouldn't <coughs> have water and shelter and so on. And I didn't know those circumstances very well, so I had to spend a lot of time finding out about, about how that works. And you are kind of responsible to make sure that your players have the information they need. Violence. Uh, and also pretend violence can cause problems. And then it's good if you have access to medical care. Then it's not great if you are 100 kilometers from civilization and without a phone. Um, action, uh, alcohol, oh, there are so many things that can happen in any environment, and especially one where people are really doing intense and action-oriented things, which can create accidents. And uh, one really trivial thing that we happen ha see often at our conferences and at things like this is that if one person becomes ill, very soon everybody is ill. And that's also like, your, your game can be absolutely ruined if everybody has a 40 degree fever or diarrhea or something like that. So it might also be really smart to think about, do we have hand cleaning facilities? Do people have their own cups to drink from or do they share all their bacteria and so on? And then another, I would just want to mention world overlap. So try, there are, of course you are playing in a fictional world, but the fictional world takes place in the real world. And there are things in the real world like traffic and so on which might affect your game that yet you haven't predicted, so you have to think about that. Like in Belarus, uh, when the player got lost in the forest, <laughs> and everybody had to break the game and look for the player, because in the real world, that person was just as disappeared in, as in the fiction. That would be an example of the worlds overlapping into each other. And al always, always, always prioritize the real world over your fiction. Mm -hmm. If they had not broken the game, if they had said, we have to keep on playing, but we're going to sort that out later, that would have been an example of stabbing the peasant. Okay. Um, physical pressure, some, using some of these things in your game, can be a completely valid design choice. Uh, it can make the LARP more intense and more meaningful, like 1943 was designed to, to include some hunger, even though it didn't include hung, hunger. In a Norwegian uh, play game in the same series, 1943, to, um, the, germ, the resistance immediately at the beginning of the game stole all the food from the German camp. And then the German soldiers only had cabbage for like two days and they were very hungry. And that was a very strong part of their gaming experience. But there's a point where that doesn't work, where it makes, where it makes role playing impossible. 
Um, but if you have a little pressure, pressure, if you are a little hungry, it's much easier to play that you're starving than if you have just had like pelmeni and a liter of beer, then, it's, then, it's, then you're quite content and then it's hard to pretend that you're starving. But physical pressure must be an active choice, not only by you, also by your players. I'd like to take a moment just to say something about lack of sleep, because many games are designed, and many events like these are designed, so that there's so much fun happening, and there's so much fun beer to be drunk, and there's so many games to play, and so much fun conversation, that unfortunately you don't have time to sleep. Or maybe the orcs will attack you, or maybe the security forces will come and wake you up in the night for a really interesting dream sequence, and then you don't get enough sleep. Enough sleep. So let's just look at the physical aspects of this. Lack of sleep impairs judgment. That means you make bad decisions, also about safety. Lack of sleep impairs concentration. That means you bad role playing, because you can't stay focused. Lack of sleep impairs cognitive skills. That means pro poor problem solving, and you will be bad at remembering in-game things. Lack of sleep can create hallucinatory states, confusion, or, again, dangerous situations, because you don't see what's in front of you. And lack of sleep takes really long to recover, recover from, which means that the, the, the experience after the game will be very negative for the player. The game will affect their life negatively. Um, this is not just for the players. This is especially for the organizers, who almost never have time to sleep during a LARP, because they just have to fix one more thing, just one more thing, just one more thing, just one more thing. Now you have to get up in 45 minutes, so it doesn't, there's no point in going to sleep anyway. No, you have to sleep. For everybody's safety, you have to sleep. If you think during the LARP you will not have time to sleep, you have to get somebody else to help you. Um, we simulate in LARPs violence to avoid these situations. We simulate physical intimacy. We simulate supernatural events because players typically cannot fly. Players are not zombies. Players don't throw fireballs. So we use simulation for all of these things. But I do want to remind you again of that peasant who was driving the dragon. The simulations itself might cause danger. Maybe if you want to fight the dragon, maybe it could be some kind of tape dragon. Like maybe, I, I was met once to a LARP where they had built a, an actual dragon the size of a house on top of a forest machine, and there was a driver inside driving the dragon, and another one being the actor of the dragon, and the dra dragon was meant to breathe fire, but there was a fire hazard thing in the forest, so they couldn't use that, thankfully. And if somebody, I mean, there was an idea that people would fight the dragon, but the dragon was like the size of this space right here on the stage, so if they had fought the dragon, the dragon could have accidentally run them over and they would have died. So now having the dragon was much more dangerous than not have the, having the dragon. You see what I mean? Uh, and just because you have a plastic sword doesn't mean that the hamster isn't still in your side of your body. So if anything comes flying towards you, you might, you may, I mean, if, even if you know, your brain knows that somebody's threatening me with an axe that is made out of foam rubber and it's soft, I might still punch them. It happens very rarely, but it does happen. Sometimes the hamster overrides the knowledge that this isn't actually dangerous. Yeah. Also, if you make very abstract or surprising or super realistic games, it's good to tell the players in advance. There, I went to, there was a game in, in Finland uh, where the scenography was a thousand kilos of flour, like you would make their big bread from on the floor. If you have asthma, you cannot play that game because you will die. And for everybody else, it was very beautiful, but you have to know about that. Some people are allergic to nuts. If you create a culture in your LARP that only eats nuts, then, nobody can, then some people cannot play that. If the LARPs are in trees or on a mountain with, with ice on the side, some body types will not be able to climb the trees or climb the mountains. So that's a, a design consideration also. Okay. Um, if you play with players from different places, it's good to find out, I mean, you can, for instance, tell your players that they should bring the food to the LARP. But it's not good if some people bring food and some people don't, and you don't have food for the ones who haven't brought food. So the information is the most important part. Uh, otherwise, when it comes to security, the fundamental thing that everybody needs to know is how to stop the game. How do you know what is real and what is not real? If somebody falls and breaks their ankle, there has to be a way for them to say, oh, 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 I am really hurt, not game hurt. Please take me to a real world doctor. <laughs> when, you, when you go, oh, and then the healer in the LARP comes <laughs> running and says, I perform the healing magic. 
it's not helpful. And I want to add another thing before I start talking about practical things, and that, that is this. This is not your responsibility, responsibility, but this is your problem. Too much enthusiasm. If you make a really good LARP, and the players are really into it, some or all players are really intensely playing, and they're having a great time, and they're deeply immersed into their characters, they may start escalating. That means making stronger. Maybe you have a game where there is no physical touching, but the game players are so into it, so they start to touch each other a little bit. And actually, they start to pretend to fight, and then they're almost really fighting, but they all think it's really cool, and it's no problem, and it's fun for everybody, and so on. What, whose fault is it when the accident happens? Eventually, you know, it will happen. Whose responsibility is it? This is difficult to judge. If only some players are escalating and some are not, it's very clear. You have to go in and stop them and you just have to tell them that they have to, to tone it down. But if all the players are loving the game and they are escalating and escalating, making more intense and more loud and more intense with no sleep at all and we're not going to eat anything, we're, we're throwing away the food and peeing on it so that we can't eat it because we're <laughs> that hardcore. Um, then if you try to stop them, you will become their enemy. <laughs> See what I mean? But I think you should. This isn't for the kinds of games we've played here. This is not really a big problem, but it can be psychologically. People can make it more and more intense. But this is something, if you make big games for very, very sort of intense games, Delirium that we heard about today had an escalation problem where the players were making it more and more and more intense. Uh, and I don't know how to solve that. I, I genuinely don't know how to solve that. But I, I want to warn you that that can happen. Okay, some useful methods. The first rule I said is it's good to have some kind of word that makes people understand that I am now speaking outside the fiction because it's an emergency or something else has happened. We, quite often we use the word off-game, so if I say, off-game, my foot is broken, then people will understand that it's a real emergency and they can stop playing and they can run away and be like to the organizer and be like, off-game, we need an off-game doctor, and then people will understand. You can do that. You can use another word, but to me this is, or even if you just say, everybody stop playing, I have a real emergency, that could also work. But you, it's good if you, tell, if you make sure that your players understand that they are allowed to do this if they need to. We saw a picture in Eric's presentation of Vikings running with swords into some kind of big Viking battle. Uh, in those kinds of games, it's, they're very loud. It's very difficult to get people's attention. And if I do try to stop the game over here, those 50, 100 guys over there might not know that we have to stop the game for some reason. When I grew up in fantasy, we had a, a, a rule called hold, which went like this. If one person yells hold, everybody who hears it must freeze and also yell hold. hold. We're going to try that now. Oh. oh! Okay, and then everybody looks around. It's a little bit like this, the pointing rule, yeah? And then you look around and you go, where is the emergency? And then you see, oh, that's something happened over here. That guy is just about to fall off the roof. And we get him off the roof. And then everybody looks around and you say, okay, game continues. And everybody says, game continues, game continues, game continues, game continues. And then you continue the game. It's really simple. It's kind of stupid simple, but it works. Okay. What about if you're playing like an intense situation and somebody starts to cry and you're torturing them and you're the torturer and you're feeling like, I don't know, is this player really in pain or and like, am I, is something going on, is everything okay? But maybe there are a bunch of people in the room and you don't want to go, off game, I just want to make sure that everything is okay. You can do that. You can design a game where that can happen. But in many games, maybe that's not possible. So you can say, you can have the ping pong rule. So you lean into the to the person and you say, in their ear, you say, <laughs> ping. <laughs> and the person, if you hear the ping, if they are okay to continue, if they're, uh, they're not, Ooh, I'm so, this is so awful, and I was the traitor, and so on. And then they hear ping, and they can look at you and go, hold. Which is just perfect. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm just role playing, it's fine. Um, this might be really good, especially if you have like kids, for instance, in a game. Uh, we, at the Dragon Bane, the Dragon game, there was a nine year old who sat and cried and cried and cried because one of the blood witches was so terrifying. And the poor blood witch, who was an English man, was like, oh my god, he took off his mask and he was like, no, seriously, I'm a really nice guy. And the nine-year-old was like, oh, stop it, I'm LARPing here. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy was like, oh no. So the ping pong rule would have been really useful for him to be like, ping? And the child would have been like, and because if the person doesn't respond, if they don't even remember the rule, then probably they shouldn't continue playing, right? Another rule that we use a lot is called cut or break. 
Uh, but for this, you have to have a workshop first to make sure that everybody understands how it works. So cut means pause the game, uh, and break means slow down or change direction. Uh, and, and you have to practice that many times so, so that everybody gets the reflex to, to cut or break if they need to. Um, otherwise, it, they're not going to do it in the game. But that, it, it, you know, it's a possibility that's there. And if you go to, I think, the workshop method site, uh, we can make sure that the workshopping method for this is there. Yeah? Um, the good thing about this is that the, it has the other option that you don't have to break the game. So, it's, so break is a little bit like ping pong. <laughs> So you say if if if, but it's you don't start it. It's the person who, themselves who who feels that if it is getting too intense, maybe I'm torturing somebody, and I feel like I can't continue playing this awful scene. I don't, I can't be in this position of being this cruel. I can go like break to the others, and then they know that I I need a way to get out of the situation. I don't want to pause the game. I want to continue playing, but I want them to to help. Uh, maybe the person who plays my boss will be like. Inquisitor Kovyanen, the president of Pony Horse, will see you now. And then maybe I will think, so then I have a way to, without stopping the game, to leave the situation. And for the person who is playing the tortured person, it's very good if they can say break. So but if they have let, let I, I've tortured them so much that they feel, I'm okay now. But if, the, if it was more, then I'm not okay. Then they have to say break. If you have this rule, it's very important that you never, that everybody can always speak. You can't put something in front of their mouth because then they can't make the sign. Yeah. <laughs> this is part of an overall larger design principle, which is about opting in and opting out, which I'm going to talk about now. Opting in means choosing to do something. If you opt in, you actively choose to participate in a situation that has not yet happened. And to be able to do this, it requires that you can imagine what the situation will be like, so that you can decide, do I want to do this or do I not want to do this? <coughs> and this means that you have to have information. To be able to give informed consent, you must be able to give uh, information. And the most important opting in position is when people choose, do I want to play your LARP? So they need to have some kind of idea of what kinds of situations they will be in, so that they can decide, is this something for me? Is this something not for me? Many people here, for instance, had the opportunity to play Delirium. Um, they looked at the information and said, whoa, this is not a LARP for me. <laughs> and that's a completely valid choice, right? So but you need to let the players be able to make that decision. This is good design practice. Uh, it's morally right, of course, because you don't trick people into doing things that they don't want to do. But it also makes better games, because it makes sure that if, at, if the players can always actively choose to do difficult things or participate in difficult situations, it, gives them, it makes them feel safer, so they can push themselves. They know they will never be forced to do anything. And it also makes sure that you get the sort of right players, the players who want to be in some situation. Those are the players who are in that situation. And some of the other players in the LARP, they will choose to do something else when that happens. Please note, it's very difficult to achieve truly informed consent, mostly because it's really difficult to explain how LARP works if you haven't tried it before. It's very, very difficult for us to explain what kinds of emotional reactions you might have to games. So even when people do make their, they, they are opting in, they may not still have known what they are choosing to do. So fundamentally it's this, if you cannot communicate with 100% clarity that the kinds of experiences that the players will have in this game, and you almost never can do that, then opting in to the LARP itself is not enough. The players must have opportunities during the LARP to opt in to parts of the LARPs or situations or scenes that happen. They have to be able to make the active choice to go into certain experiences. Or they have to have the, also have the opportunity to opt out. I'm already in this game. But I, no, I'm not going to leave this game, or I'm not, not going to go into that room, because that room is where that stuff happens. I will go into the other room and play this other kind of scene. So opting out is choosing not to participate in something that has already happened, or is about to, to, that has already started, or that is about to happen. Having the possibility not to participate in a situation requires seeing it coming. Again, you have to be able to imagine it before, beforehand, or at least some kind of idea. Not participating equals having the possibility to steer the gameplay away from that kind of a, of a story, or to cut the game, or to leave the situation. And there are some warnings about this as well. 
once you're in the game, you might have peer pressure. Like maybe on the first day when we were LARPing and we didn't know each other very well, some of you were uncomfortable in some game and you felt that you still have to keep playing because otherwise, what will the others think? Maybe the, the others wouldn't have judged you, maybe, but in your mind, you felt that the others might judge you. And in some places, maybe if you, it's LARP in a workplace, nobody wants to, to break before the, post the game before the boss does it, or something like that could, could happen. We assume, we, have, we think that everybody else has some expectations on us. This is normally not true. And nobody cares what you do, basically. But we all go around and think that everybody else will judge us if we make some kind of decision. We're really curious about the story, so we want to go into that room because we want to know what happens in that room. I'm really scared of that room, but maybe I, I kind of still want to, and then I'm like, okay, the only way for me to know what happens is to go there. So then I decide to go and play that thing, even though I know in my heart of hearts that I might not actually want to do that. And the network of fictional relationships inside the fiction can be very strong. So if I have a sister in the LARP, and my, she's my best friend, and the sister says, let's go into that room, for me, as a, my character would do that. For me as a player, it can be very hard to go like, no, I'm uh, going to go to the dining room instead. You know. So there are many ways why it's difficult to opt out. The most important is that you think that you don't want to pause the game. And I, I would just point out some arguments against, against this. When you are LARPing, you think you don't want to pause the game because you think it will break the LARP for you and for everybody. This is not true. A pause very rarely affects your experience of the story. Because after the LARP, your, your brain takes out all the bits when you were not playing and puts all the playing bits together so it becomes a coherent story. In many LARPs, you take a break in the evening and then you go to sleep and then you continue playing in the morning. And that doesn't ruin the LARP. So why would it ruin the LARP if you took a five minute break or if you left the situation? It doesn't ruin the LARP, but we think it does when, when we're in the story. Okay, a pause may affect the atmosphere uh, in the situation. Like some, somebody's having some really intense emotional play and then somebody says, break or, or cut, guys, I need to not do this. Can we talk about how we're playing this? And, and then of course, everybody's sort of focus goes a little bit like, Phew. but maybe you can do something to help that. Maybe you can build a little ritual, for instance, that says that every time we have had a break, when we continue the game, we'll close our eyes and then we'll count down 10, 9, 8, and so on. And then when you get to zero, everybody has to regain their concentration and they're back in the game. You can build in things like that that will make it easier to break because you know it's easier to come into the game. And actually, I think the pauses tend to make the game better because then everybody is much safer at it where they are. And of course, a lot of the meta techniques like playing in a black box or something like that, they are also, also pauses and they make the game a lot better. But if you want to make it possible for people to opt out of difficult situations in your life, Uh, you can ask these questions. Is it necessary for the fiction? Is it necessary in the story that all of the characters are always present? Or that if there's something intense happened, maybe there's a, I don't know, there's a trial, and then the, the mayor of the village decides that everybody has to be there, or if it's an execution or something. Is it really necessary that everybody has to be there? Because then the char it's very difficult for the players to go if their characters have to be there. You can change the story so that it's not necessary for everybody to be there. Is it physically possible to leave? I was at a LARP once where something incredibly intense was happening on a sort of stage and there was only one room, one door in the room and all the characters of the LARP was there. And I was sitting next to a girl who was panicking. She really needed to go because this was some kind of sexual thing and she did not want to see that. But she felt that if she stands up now and goes across the room and leaves the room, everybody will see and everybody will judge her. It was not physically possible for her to leave uh, right then. And people would have played her. They would have been like, Oh, so you are leaving, you know, and, and that, that was just silly. If you want to make that, those kinds of scenes, at least make sure that it's possible to choose to opt out once it has begun. Have you workshop the break and cut rules if you're using them? Again, you have to do that, otherwise they don't work. And what is the social cost in your LARP of pausing the fiction? Uh, you can fix that by letting somebody who has very high status in your group, or maybe yourself, pauses the fiction like very early in the LARP, they pause. You can just pretend for some reason that you pause. And you never have to say why you pause. So you just go cut, and then I, I'm really like, uncomfortable with this. Let's play this other thing instead. And then everybody plays the other thing instead. And then you have established that it's okay to cut. Yeah, and it's actually to be able to opt out of situations is really smart because players need to go to the bathroom and sometimes somebody gets a cold and then they have to leave the LARP. So like, just design 
ways for people to not always be in the same place is a smart thing, especially in long games, because it just makes every, all the practical things so much easier. Okay. So much about the practical stuff. Now we get into the emotional woo things. <coughs> about role playing. Okay. Role playing equals or in role playing usually has to do with these following things. Fictional situations with interesting emotions, love, boredom, anger, fear, shame, and so on. And fictional social relationships between these characters. Family status, comradeship, trust, loyalty, brother, sisterhood, and so on. You notice that I say that the emotions are not fictional. Fictional situations with emotions, but the emotions are real. This has to do with the how the, it's your body, it's your hamster brain, it's your body feeling the emotions, if you're happy in the lark, you are also happy. The character is happy. You're happy because the character is happy, but you're still feeling the emotions. They are real. The social relationships are fictional. These are relationships between people that don't exist, so the relationships don't really exist. But they exist during the game. When you are, when your sister is trying to talk you into going into that room, in that moment, that is a real relationship. After the game ends, that Relationship disappears, but the emotion will stay with you. You might still like the player who played your sister, even if you don't know that person. Uh, and you may be angry at that person because they forced you to go into the room, even though it was only the character. You see what I mean? So the, the emotion can be real, but the relationship is fictional. When we play role-playing games, something happens that is sometimes called the role-playing contract. And to be able to play together, we make this decision uh, that we, we are not going to judge the player, we're not going to judge the player based on what the character does or who the character is. And while we're playing, we're also not going to treat the character differently depending on who is playing that character. We agree that the actions in the game will not have the consequences they would have off-game. So if my sister betrays me in a LARP, I'm, I will not hate that person forever. We promise each other that, that, we will, that we will keep the fiction in the fiction and keep the real world stuff outside. But now you've already seen the previous slide, so you see the problem with this. This is, I mean, this agreement is necessary because it makes it possible to play, but it isn't quite true. It, and it's not just this. I mean, if you play ice hockey, for instance, uh, it's a violent sport and they will be fighting on the ice and people might bleed. And that, that, has, that doesn't have consequences. We don't send people to prison for fighting in ice hockey. If the same exact people would have the same exact fight in the parking lot outside the hockey arena, then we would send them to prison because it's illegal to behave that way. And then they would be really upset for real. But we also understand that sometimes theater actors really do fall in love with people they play relationships with. And sometimes hockey players get really angry at other hockey players who punch them on the ice. And the same thing is also true a little bit about LARP. So, emotions and experiences do travel into the game, and they do travel out of the game, because the player and the character have the same body. And as I said before, this is actually good. I mean, this is why fiction is interesting. This is why we tell stories, because we want to organize the world in these stories, which have a beginning and a middle and an end, and heroes and villains and relationships and emotions. That is why, why we have culture as humans. But of course, it also means that that because role playing builds, the, the pleasure of role playing is that emotions travel in and out of the game. We can't always exactly control or predict if maybe we are, which feelings we will have after the game or during the game. So when emotions travel in or out of the game, accidentally or on purpose, then it's called bleed. But, and bleed can be positive experiences or negative experiences. It's not harmful, but it's unpredictable. And I want to say this. Players seem to re react strongest, not to strong themes. So if you have uh, played a, a, games, a game about people who, who are dying from HIV, uh, from AIDS, um, and I think the, the, the death, wa death was a very strong theme in the game, but I think probably the people who had the strongest reactions, they did not react strongly because of the theme of the game. They reacted strongly because they were in situations in the LARP which reminded them of the things that had happened in their real life. And this can actually be very trivial. Maybe I, I play, uh, some friend of mine played, has played all kinds of very awful and tragic and dark LARPs. And then she played the cook at a Harry Potter LARP. And the cook had a love story with some, and it was a really like, la 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 LARP. 
And, and accidentally, the, story, the plot of the game became very similar to a love story that she had had much, much, much earlier in her life. And she remembered suddenly all of those old emotions, and she said that it was so awful. She just cried and cried and cried. It was the worst LARP she had ever been at. <laughs> I mean, and, it, and, and it was a really jolly, happy magic LARP, you know. And, and sometimes, and this is, you cannot stop this from happening. Sometimes this will happen. Uh, but it's good if we can take care of it when it does happen. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about social safety. A big part about feeling safe, I mean, out here in the real world, in this room, a big part of how, how safe and how good we feel about ourselves has to do with people around us affirming, that means um, uh, validating or, or, or proving the, the, an approving and approving of the, of the identity we have. Here, for instance, we are or will all very soon be LARP designers. And we think that LARP is being LARP designers is a cool thing, so we all support each other in this. And we have a group community because of this, and it makes us happy. Uh, but that we are also other things, we're men and women and in between, and we are, we are all kinds of, we all have all kinds of, so we are shy or talkative, or we are from different countries, or we have different kinds of personalities, uh, and we are the happy one, or we are the lonely one, or something, and then the people around us are sort of behaving those roles around us, yeah. So a lot of our, our identity that we experience or that we perform has to do with something that is created not from our personalities, but from everybody around us. Um, and that means that when we LARP together, when we create those fictional temporary relationships, it's a threat to our ad identity. Not a big, a tiny little threat. It makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and it might be uncomfortable also because sometimes being inside the LARP is better than being outside the LARP. Right. So I just wrote this down like this. When social relationships, love, envy, aggression, hierarchies, etc., bleed into or out of the fiction, it is uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable because we feel that it's a threat to who we are in the real world. And this can happen accidentally, or it can be used on purpose. You can take things from your character and say, whoa, look at that, I was really brave. I've always thought that I'm not brave, but it's my body being brave in this social situation, so maybe I am brave. And then you can take that with you and be brave for the rest of your life. Because you, you have already been brave. You've clearly, provenly been really brave. So you might as well just make that part of your personality. But of course, it might also go the other way around. I don't know. Maybe not here because we don't know each other very well. But maybe you LARP with like an ex-boyfriend and then he's really mean to you in the LARP for no reason other than they don't like you as the, the player. Though that could also happen. And then that will make you sad. Okay, so how do we make this, how do we design against this? I think an important thing is that if you have intense games, or even just any kind of game, let the players get to know each other before the game if they don't already know each other. So if they have a real world relationship to return to, then the fictional relationship can be sort of thrown away because the real world relationship is worth more. After the game, it's nice to talk about the experience. I'll talk about that more soon. And after the game, you can ask, Every player can ask for themselves, or you as an organizer can make sure that the players ask themselves, perhaps in groups of two or something like that, to ask, what would I like to bring with me from this game into my life? Because what, what of these real experiences would I like to take into my life? And what would I just like to stay inside the story? When you go to a movie, you don't have this conversation with yourself. Oh, what of this movie-going experience would I like to take into my life? I would like to be more like Bruce Willis. But I mean, because you haven't actually been Bruce Willis, you've just watched him, watched him do it. So it's not like even if you decide to be more like Bruce Willis, that might actually, you walk down three blocks and then you've forgotten and you're not Bruce Willis anymore, you know. But if you have physically been a hero for two days, you can decide to be a little bit more heroic in your real life, and that's real, you get, you can, you get to make that choice. But there's still stories, you know, you can decide, okay, all this sad stuff, all this depressing stuff, I'm going to let it go to the place where Bruce Willis is. They can go there where the stories are. That's okay for me. Sadness. After LARPs, people are often sad. And sometimes people can be quite sad. So it's good to look at what are... Even, and even people who are super happy after a LARP can also be sad. It's weird. Why are we sad after LARPs? Okay. We have some grief because we have lost a community. We have belonged to a fictional community and then that fictional relationship has disappeared. And that makes us sad because humans like to belong to things. And if, especially if you're in a situation where you're maybe a little lonely in the real world right now for some reason, 
or sad, and you'd be really happy inside the game. That can make you super sad because it was much nicer to be inside the fiction. Maybe you lose the world, and that makes you sad. Because when you were inside the LARP, you could pretend to believe in the magical pony forest, and then you come back, and Ruta is amazing, but Ruta is not as amazing as the magical pony forest. And then you cry a little bit because you would have liked to continue living in the magical pony forest, and then you're like, I'm an idiot, why am I crying about the pony forest? <laughs> but it's okay. Sometimes we just react like that. Sometimes, you know, you read a really good book and then it ends, and then you cry because you're so angry because you would have wanted to stay in Harry Potter world manga. That can also happen, you know. It's okay. And you can tell your players that it's okay if that's what happens, you know. You can, you can say that out loud and then people will be like, <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I, I would also want to be in the pony forest. And then you laugh and then you cry and then you laugh and then you're fine. <laughs> you can have empathy sadness about the real world. Maybe you make some LARP about something that happens in reality. Huntsville would be a good example about that. And then after the game, you have a very strong reaction because it's awful that these things happen. This is, these are real experiences, not for you, but for other people, and it's awful, and it makes you sad, and the world is unfair, and you can't really do anything about it, and that's really depressing, and that might make you cry. That's a good kind of sadness. That might then turn into some anger, and then maybe you do something, can do something about it later. Um, but it's good if you're, and not all players will have that reaction, but some players might react, might react like that, and then it's good to say, okay, I, I hear you, I see why you're sad, and that's a really valid reason to be sad. And often LARPs, even Magical Ponies, stupid LARPs, can give you perspective on your life. Suddenly you look at your own life and you're like, wait a minute, I have, I'm not a Magical Pony. I'm actually not even, I don't even have the job that I like. I'm in a bad relationship, I'm, you know, and sometimes being somebody else, even if it's just for an hour, can make you look at your own life in a, in a different light and see yourself very cl clearly. And some players have a very strong emotional reaction that is not about the LARP, it's about their real life. And going on vacation can have the exact same effect, or going on a, being an exchange student or something like that can have the exact same effect. But this is not your fault as organizers, but if you have a person who is sad for something like that, they might not even be able to tell you that that's the reason. So the only thing you can do is like say, would you like a hug? And can I listen to you talk? And can I give you a cup of tea? And then make sure that you have time to, to support them if they are sad for a reason like that. Okay. Sometimes in LARP we like to talk about psychological safety. And I just want to say this. There are zero documented cases of LARPs causing mental health problems. LARPs, as far as we know, do not make people crazy. <laughs> However, strong reactions, strong LARP situations, like any strong situations in life, strong experiences, can trigger pre-existing mental problems. And one out of ten, more, more, part, more of us, will have some kind of mental health situation during our life. And I think some of us are much more ill than others. And for people who already are ill, if they have a very intense situation, that could be a trigger for, for something. I have never seen anything awful happen from this. I've never heard of anything really awful happen, happening uh, from, from a triggered experience like this, but it, it's hypothetically possible. Typically, lack of sleep is a big factor also here. So if you're worried about the mental health of your participants, make sure that they get eat to eat regularly and that they get enough sleep and that they get enough cups of tea if they're sad. And that will help you quite a lot. You probably don't need a psychologist if everybody gets eight hours of sleep. See what I mean? But this is not a big problem. Everybody imagines it because the reactions are so strong. But I, I really genuinely have not seen this happen ever. And I've been doing this for over 20 years. Just under 20 years. However, be attentive off game to how people are feeling. Maybe you have a friend who is really depressed right now or is really manic right now or something like that. And you know that about them. Maybe don't suggest to, to take them with you to a LARP. That would be, might be, might be uh, bad. That is to say, we don't know very much about the negative effects. That's not documented. But positive effects are also not documented. And I have heard a lot of stories of people saying that LARPs has, has had very positive effects on people who are depressed, for instance. I don't know. You're welcome to make research on this. This is the most important slide in these presentations. LARPs do seem to trigger mental health problems, <laughs> primarily depression and exhaustion, in LARP organizers. Not participants, but LARP organizers. Because of physical stress and economic stress. 
When you start making LARPs, you fall in love with your LARP and the, you, the LARP becomes your baby and you want it to be the perfect LARP and then you make that LARP and then you want to make another and another and another and another and you also have to go to work or do your studies and have your relationship. And they don't understand why you put all this, uh, these hours into your LARP and you don't have the budget so you're going to build everything yourself out of cardboard. And it takes one million hours and then the game is over and then you're really depressed and broken because you haven't slept for three months. So be careful about that. Okay. Now we're reaching the end of the presentation, so now I'm just going to talk about some practical things that you can do before, during, and after the game to ensure the social and psychological safety of your players. And there are many more things that it's possible to do, and we can talk about that all week. But here are just some things that we think work pretty well. I can't say that we promise that they work pretty well, because this hasn't actually been tried out really well. These are things that we do that seem to work, uh, but we don't know why. Quite often, I think just being around people who like you is the best protection against all problems. Do you see what I mean? And maybe some of these things are completely unnecessary, but they're nice, so I'm going to tell you about them anyway. <laughs> the game happens inside some kind of symbolic space and time limit, and that's called in sociology a magic circle. It's a very nice name, I think. And if you want to, I mean, uh, you could argue that the game begins when the players start to hear about the game, and then the game ends maybe never, because after the game you, st you think about the game, and then you talk about the game, and your experience of the game changes, and your memory of the game changes, and the game never ends because it stays with you forever. Yeah, whatever. But if there is a point when you are in-game, in-character, and there is a point where you're not in character. And that would be sort of the magic circle. Yes. Here I am, Magic the Pony Horse. And here I am, Johanna Kongeren. And you can make some kind of ritual limit to make it very clear to everybody when you are in the game, in the story, and when you're not. It's nice to make maybe some kind of countdown. Perhaps you can make a ritual where everybody walks through a specific door and enters the game and they know that I'm going to leave Johanna Kolinen behind a little bit and I'm going to become Magic the Pony Horse. Three, two, one. And then at the end of the game, you leave through the same door and you know that I'm going to leave Magic the Pony Horse behind and you become Johanna Kolinen again this year. And then you laugh and you maybe cry and maybe hug somebody and so on. You can do a little ritual. It could be that, it could be a song, maybe you play the same music at the beginning and the end of the LARP, that's very usual, and so on. You can have maybe your character, maybe every character has some item with them, a piece of jewelry or something, and, and you burn it after the game to leave the character behind together, for instance. And then maybe you have the conversation, what of this character do I want to take with me into my life? And then you take off the ring or the hat and you say, goodbye, Magic the Pony Horse. And then everybody burns their pony horse hats and then you can leave the game together, for instance. You can establish a LARP body. Uh, that you can speak with during the game. I make a, a, an agreement with Orke that while we are LARPing, if I need to go and, play and talk to somebody who knows that I'm not actually a magical pony horse, I can make a hand sign. In, in my LARP culture, we use this, the fish finger. Very discreetly, and Orke sees it, and he understands that I need to talk, and then we go somewhere where nobody else can hear us, and then he says, Jok, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know, Magic the Pony Horse is depressing me a little bit, and blah, 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 and then we talk, and then after a while, he's like, are you okay now? And I say, I'm okay. He says, do you want to go back and play some more? And I'm like, yeah, actually, yeah, let's go LARP. And then you go to LARP. You can do that. You can have a LARP off-game body that you can hang with. Um, and if I get to know all of you before we start playing, it's easier, of course. Okay. Um, after the game, ritual border, you exit the game. Then some things happen. Immediate reactions. Often maybe an applause or people start laughing because the tension goes away and it's like weird. Or people start crying. Oh, and you're like, why are we crying? I don't even know why we're crying. I don't know. That can also happen. I mean, whatever. <laughs> Anything can happen. After that, as an organizer, you gather your players. Uh, and that was a good time to make some kind of leaving the role ritual, if you haven't already done that. Then the debrief happens, which I think is a little bit like, this, like the talks that we've had at the end of the day here. Uh, you can talk about your personal reactions to the day and some, some reflections that you have had. Uh, if you have a very large LARP, don't do it all together. Maybe switch, do it in small groups. If you don't have facilitators for the groups, you can have prepared maybe a little paper where it says, discuss these five questions together in the group. How is everybody feeling right now? What was 
uh, have, has something been disappointing about the game? What has been uh, interesting about the game? I mean, you can do any kind of questions. It's like, what is the feeling on the top of your mind? It could be anything. Um, and then if your game has had a te theme, especially, of course, if it's an educational th th game, it's a good idea to have some organized conversation of what you have learned. But do the emotional stuff separately, because if, you, if people are like really woo after the game, and you want to talk to them seriously about political history, that's not a good time. They might need to say, it was really exciting when we were spying on the partisans, and then that happened, and then that happened. That's also important, so make some space for that. And when that's done, then you can talk about what they have learned. I heard about this great rule today from, uh, from, from Eric. When we learn, we are in the first person. I am, what have I written? I am President Wonder Horse. I am the partner of Super Stallion. That being inside the LARP feels like that. But it's a good idea in the debrief after, when you talk about the game, to say, to make a rule that, okay, now we have stopped playing, so now we will talk about our characters in the third person. Maybe we, I would say then, Wonder Horse did this, and then Wonder Horse was spying on the partisans, and that was very exciting. Uh, and then I, and then I'm talking about myself, then I, Johanna Collin and the player, I felt that it would be interesting if Wonder Horse would get more and more paranoid as the game went on. So I took the game in that direction. And Wonder Horse did this and this because of that paranoia. You, you see the distinction. People will automatically start to say, and then I did this when they mean the, the character. And then you can very gently say, oh, Wonder Horse. And then they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, Wonder Horse did that. He did that, I did that. Um, when the game ends, is also the moment when everybody constructs the story of the LARP, because everybody has had a different experience, unless it's a very small LARP where everybody's in the same room. But even then you don't know what the other players and characters have felt and, and experienced. So often uh, people talk about what happened, and then a sort of average story appears. What happened in this LARP? Who was the traitor in Snaphane? Was that person really the traitor? No. The person wasn't the traitor. Well, we made this decision for these reasons. We made the decision to send this person to a prison camp, for instance. And maybe people need to talk about that because they are interested in to see the other sides of the story that they have not experienced. But at the same time, people often have another conversation, which is, was this a good game or was this a bad game? Was it disappointing? Am I stressed and tired and am I angry at the organizers because they didn't give me food and I haven't slept for three days? Mm -hmm. And also Wonder Horse was in internal escalation and Wonder Horse pissed on my food and now I'm really hungry. <laughs> Um, so it, they also need to talk about that and this is a dangerous moment because some people may have had a really good LARP and some people may have had a really bad LARP and it often happens that the, bad, the people who are disappointed ruin the game for the others or that the people who are very happy make the, the people who are, who are disappointed feel that they are not being heard so you may need to help them with that uh, but mostly after the LARP, the post-LARP fallacy happens, which is we all did this together and we invested a lot of time and we traveled to Lithuania, perhaps, or something. We want it to be good. So we pretend that we like it, even if we didn't like it. And then only after we go away and, you know, I didn't like it, but the old Wonder Horse story was really stupid. So it's, it's good if you're an organizer to pay a little attention. If somebody looks like they're very quiet when everybody else is happy, talk to that person after, because they may have some really good feedback or they may be really angry at you and maybe they just need to tell you how angry they are. And then you listen and say, okay, yeah, I, I hear that. I'm really sorry you feel that way. Do you have any suggestions for how I could prevent that if I do this again? Yeah. Uh, different players have different needs. Don't force everybody to group hug. Uh, a really good idea is if there are intensive scenes is to ask the players to find people that they've had intense scenes with and just talk to them to make sure that everything is okay. At, at Delirium, I, one of my most intense scenes was completely random. A person that I had no contact with in the game came up to me and said, I hate you. And I was like, how do you even know that guy? Where about the hell? And it was awful. Like Afterwards, I felt really bad. And I went up to the player and said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I just need to talk to you about the thing when you said, I hate you. And he said, what? When you said, I hate you. And he said, I'm really sorry. I don't remember that. My character hated everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I had a really strong reaction, and he didn't even remember it. But then he was fine. Then we had, when we had talked about it, it was OK. Because I walked around thinking, have I done something? That, is it the player who's angry with me? No, it was nothing. But uh, it's important to get that stuff out. If you play a love story, it's also good to be like, OK, this is a little weird. How are we now? You know, to just talk about it. It'll be fine. Uh, often after the game we have a party and that's pretty good because then people get to be themselves together. 
it also gives them a time to spend to be able to talk about the fiction together. Because when you leave the LARP and you go back to your ordinary life, nobody will have that, had the same experience. And maybe Snaphane was really interesting, and you want to talk about Snaphane for hours and hours, and your husband might not be super interested because he wasn't there. <laughs> so it's a good idea to have, to have the party for that. Maybe if you, can have, if you have a LARP buddy, you can make an agreement that everybody calls their LARP buddy after a week and talks to them. After the LARP, people will say, we have to meet soon, we, 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 we should have a meetup next month, and we should all meet again. Next month, you usually don't need that anymore. But at the time, it feels really important, and if somebody wants to meet up after a month, fine, let them do that. That's all I have now. Uh, that's my website up there, but the really important one is nordiclark.org, because there you can find uh, a wiki and links to all kinds of, of things. Uh, yeah. Um, also about safety. I'm writing about LARP safety this year, and it's not going to be out until next year. But when it's out, you can find information about it on nordiclark.org. Thank you.